assemble around the table here. It says I'm supposed to gavel into the meeting, but I don't have a gavel. So. <laughs> Appreciate uh, those that are uh, in person in, in attendance. I understand also that uh, we've got some folks that are uh, joining us online as well through Zoom, and I appreciate you all uh, attending too. I am at this juncture uh, going to call the roll. I guess I'll note that the... Uh, that the meeting has started at 105. Okay, at this time I'll start the roll. Uh, Honorable Denise Bentley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ends up coming. Uh, Lieutenant Bogard. Yes, sir. Colonel Burnett. Okay. Judge Cottoff. Thank you, sir. Judge uh, Cunningham. Uh, oh, is it? Okay. Okay. Hey, Lori, how are you? Uh, Mayor Gregory. I see him on screen there. All right. Commissioner Jellick. Yes, sir. Chairman uh, Massey. Here. All right, there you are, my friend. Mr. McGee. Hey, good afternoon. How are you, How sir? Are you, are you? So, Mr. Nich Mr. Nicholson. Present. All right. Uh, Damon, Mr. Preston. Present. Mr. Ross. Here. Sir. I think I saw Sheriff Scholler here on screen. Uh, Inspector Thomas, right. Chairman Westerfield. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? Uh, Dr. Wright. Here. Right. Thank you. All right. I think I've gone. I'm going to say uh, Miss Bentley. Is that her trying to connect? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Denise Bentley? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, all right. And you said Colonel Burnett's still on his way? Yes, oh, okay. I see. I see. All right, that is everyone in a suit today, which is uh, a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, well, uh, again, appreciate all of you all uh, taking time out of your very busy schedules. You know the, the routine at this point. Obviously, we'll add a couple of additional components today, which you all will bring into your subcommittees. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to, to EKU for... Uh, allowing this this opportunity to, to host uh, uh, this task force meeting here uh, today. Ethan Witt has obviously been of great help and President McFadden. I know others on the IT staff have been terrific in, in helping us uh, assemble today's uh, meeting. And so I appreciate everyone uh, on, on that front. Uh, it is nice to be able to come to one of our public universities and see the wonderful work that's going on uh, at our public universities and again appreciate you all giving us the opportunity to do this here today. Uh, I want to welcome our public attendees as well those that are, are in person see a lot of faces here uh, today and then obviously uh, on zoom and then watching via our, our live stream. I want to make mention that uh, the public participation policy is, is posted on our website and per that policy, up to five members of the public 
Uh, we'll be given three minutes to share comments at each meeting, uh, provided that they email 24 hours in advance uh, of the meeting. Uh, we did not receive any emails requesting the chance to speak at this meeting, uh, but if you'd like to speak during the public comment portion, uh, please see the sign-in sheet uh, that is located by the door here. Uh, we look forward to your comments and questions at the end of today's meeting. Uh, and of course, the members of the public can always submit written comments to uh, search warrant tf at ky.gov. I'll say that again, search warrant tf, all one word, at ky.gov. I want to make note as well, and as we've previously discussed, uh, the task force is subject to the Kentucky Open Meetings Act and, of course, the Open Records Act. Uh, this means that a quorum of the task force or a quorum of any committee uh, should not meet outside the regular meeting schedule. Uh, but if they do, they shall not discuss public business. It also means that all public re records must be open for inspection. Uh, and public records generally includes records prepared, owned, used in possession of or retained by a public agency. Uh, for members of the task force uh, that are seeking mileage reimbursements to, to turn to another subject, uh, please see an office uh, staff member. And if any of you all have questions during the day, uh, feel free to wave down any one of the AG team here. You all are by this time familiar with all of them, Blake, Elizabeth, Joseph Fons, Andrew King, uh, are here to assist you if you, you need any help. At this time, I, I know I mentioned uh, Lori Dudgeon, but I'm going to uh, say that I'm honored to have you all here as, as representing the Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, you all obviously play an essential role in the facilitation of uh, the judicial framework that we have here in, in the Commonwealth and uh, in search warrants in particular. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, representing AOC is uh, Director Lori Dudgeon uh, and Jason McGinnis, as well as um, uh, who's the Deputy Director. Uh, and I also want to give Lori a chance, if she'd like, to make a few comments. No pressure at all, but certainly if you want to speak for a few moments, I'll allow you to do so. General, thank you, and um, thanks to Barry for the conversation last week, just sort of updating us, and realized maybe there were some things that we needed to update the task force about, if that's okay. Um, really, and, and much of that has been our work on trying to get forms ready for the rollout and implementation date of Senate Bill 4, which I know everybody here knows the effective date is, is June 29th. Um, just quickly, an overview for folks who may not know what the Administrative Office of the Courts is, and and in all candor, I think when I was a young practicing lawyer, I really thought all we did was prepare forms. And I really think lots of days that is still the majority of, of what we do. But we are a unified court system. We have 406 elected justices, judges, court clerks, and then we have 3,500 non-elected uh, personnel across the state. Half of our non-elected workforce is our deputy clerks. The other half are judicial staff, pretrial officers, specialty court staff, and then court-designated workers statewide. Um, we have the benefit of, of having a unified court system, and what that does is make a lot of things really possible that might not be possible in other states. So that may be the implementation and rollout of a statewide form for search warrants. So we've had a form that we used historically. I brought with me today just to share with this committee if you would like. The updated draft of where we are with the new affidavit pursuant to Senate Bill 4, we're going to be consistent with our numbering in this series. The affidavit will be form number 335.1. And then the new warrant itself pursuant to Senate Bill 4 will be 340.1. We've worked with a number of our stakeholders. And as I mentioned, this draft is still just that, a draft. So I would caution everybody to understand one of the things I think the timing is really good. I think we're still waiting on comments back from state police. That's the law enforcement representative on this group. So there's still time, as I'm looking around the room, if you're a member of law enforcement, 
to get in touch with state police or us if you have comments. Um, one of the things that I want to mention um, is when we sort of saw this coming several months ago, we reached out to state police and we were able to um, partner on a grant funded by the Justice Cabinet to create an e-search warrant process for exactly this statewide. Uh, a, a few sessions ago, Senator Whitney Westerfield um, passed KRS 455-170, which is the statutory authorization for an e-search warrant. We just hadn't have a mechanism quite yet. This grant's going to make this available. I think the biggest barrier and what this group probably needs to be aware of, that at least I know about so far, is that um, local law enforcement may lack the technology and hardware to make use of these search warrants widely available. So I just think something that group needs to know. Happy to take any questions, if anybody has any, and then I can also just leave copies here to share with each of the task force members. Thank you, Ms. Dudgeon. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, I, I do have one question, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sir, sir. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, is AOC in the process of building a um, technological infrastructure to be able to collect the data on search warrants that are sought and those search warrants that are granted in each of the state's jurisdictions and to consolidate that at a single location? Excellent question and, and one that we have talked about um, because the majority of search warrants that are issued in the Commonwealth don't actually result in a court case. We've never had a, a database or the infrastructure available to do that. Frequently that is a document that solely law enforcement is aware of. We may not be aware other than the fact that one of our judges may issue it. Now, I wanna just say, if it's a recommendation of this task force that we find a way to make that happen, we will do our very best to find a way to make that happen. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Hello. Can you hear me? This is Denise Bentley. Um, any additional recommendations from this task force? I'm not aware of any, but um, I know that Justice Keller is chairing our criminal rules committee, and I know that this will be one of the issues I believe that they talk about as well. There, and I understand that uh, folks may differ on that opinion, and that could be an issue among those members, but yes. Ms. Bentley, question? Yes. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to ask um, the director if there's, a, and the question may have been asked, I'm having some type of feedback, but um, has, has there ever been a price tag attached to Attorney McGee's question? No, ma'am. Thank you. And I'm just going to restate it. Has there been a price tag attached to building such a database, correct? Yes, ma'am. Oh, ma ma well, Director, thank you so much. I appreciate giving us that overview as it relates to the search warrant task force and uh, look forward to having you all continue uh, to be a part of this conversation. So. And thank you for bringing those drafts as well. All right. Well, at this point, um, because of uh, just the efforts of the Kentucky Department of Criminal Justice uh, training, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing uh, Doug Barnett, uh, Legal Training Section Supervisor, uh, and Shannon West, uh, Critical Skills Section Supervisor, uh, to, uh, to speak um, uh, and uh, give a brief presentation. Um, 
don't know if you all want to use this podium or want to come up here or. In the podium. If, uh, if everybody can hear me, I'm just going to stand while I speak, if that's okay with everybody. We arrange this. I'm one of these folks who just love to stand and speak while I'm teaching or, or giving any type of instruction. But uh, good afternoon, Mr. Attorney General, uh, members of General Assembly, uh, Mr. Public Advocate, Commissioner, honored guests, distinguished members of the public. I'm Doug Barnett. I am the um, legal training section supervisor for the Department of Criminal Justice Training. And I've come to speak a little about the types of training that we provide in the legal training section. And uh, Mr. West will talk about the training that we provide in tactics. And uh, there's some opportunities where we both tag team with respect to the legal training that we have and with respect to the tactical training that we have. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Um, as you know, the mission of the Department of Criminal Justice Training is to provide the most current and relevant law enforcement training to the Commonwealth's law enforcement uh, agencies. And the legal training section exists to ensure that recruits and in-service training uh, personnel receive the most current, most relevant, and most appropriate legal training in order to fulfill this mission for the Commonwealth. For basic training, we first go into a strong foundation for our officers so that they can begin their law enforcement career. During that basic training period, we talk significantly about Kentucky statutes. We talk significantly about US Supreme Court cases. We talk significantly about the decisions of the Sixth Circuit. We talk significantly about the decisions of the Kentucky Appellate Courts, the Kentucky uh, Supreme Court, the Kentucky Court of Appeals. And the reason for that is that is the heart of not only law enforcement, but that is also the heart of individual liberty with the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and other constitutional rights, particularly the right to due process and the right to equal protection. That's the reason why we spend a lot of time in depth with respect to training on search and seizure. Um, first and foremost, Let me see if uh, we don't seem to be working. Well, first and foremost, what I'm going to do while the uh, slide is coming up, I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are as a legal training section. We have six attorneys on staff, myself and five others, Mr. Michael Swindeman, Ms. Kelly Cog, Mr. David Smith, Ms. Jenny Reed, and Mr. Graham Tremble. We have a collective experience of 142 years of varied background, some in private practice, some in um, um, governmental service, some with the attorney general's office and as a past career, things of that nature. For calendar year 2019, we have had a total of 1,971 hours of legal training across the board. And this was the most recent statistics that we had because uh, 2020, we had COVID issues and that's not really a good judge of where we are. But in basic training in 2019, we taught 1,085 hours of basic training with 97 hours in each basic training curriculum of all legal classes. And you see some of the other hours that we do with respect to legal training. And I'm gonna focus mainly more on what we do with respect to search and seizure and things of that nature. Some of the stuff that we put out as a publications for the legal training section that are available to law enforcement, the Kentucky Criminal Law Manual, which has all the statutes that we uh, discuss in basic training. It has uh, the entire Kentucky Penal Code. It has 189A DUI law, traffic law 189, controlled substance law 218. It's a very comprehensive guide to Kentucky's law and Kentucky's penal code. It's available on the DOCJT publications website, as is a lot of the other in, uh, publications that you see here. The legal handbook for patrol, that is more of a pocket guide for law enforcement. The asset forfeiture manual, which has a model policy, which state law requires if an agency participates in asset forfeiture. The Kentucky discipline manual, which talks about the police officer's bill of rights. And then we do uh, summaries of cases that have come down from the appellate courts, the US Supreme Court, Sixth Circuit, and the Kentucky appellate courts. So we can get that information out to law enforcement in a timely manner. And these are usually updated every quarter. 
And sometimes every half year, we go, I'll go back through it. I will keep reviewing and making sure that those get out there once they become final opinions so law enforcement can have those. We also do summaries of open records uh, decisions that impact law enforcement. And we also create a search and seizure casebook, which we do use for our basic training. This material is included on the DOCJT website under legal publications. And as you know, the most important uh, aspect with respect to law enforcement is where um, law enforcement's authority is, and also to what protections the citizens of the Commonwealth and the United States have with respect to their constitutional rights. And that falls in the Fourth Amendment, where we have the right of the people to be secure in their houses, their postings, their papers, their effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and that shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, which particularly describes the place to be searched and the personal things to be seized. Our training goes specifically to the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. What does law enforcement need to do? The specifics they need to provide, things of that nature. How does, how does this be done? That's what we're talking about. First and foremost, when we get a basic training class, the first thing we talk about is the ethical duty. Law enforcement has an ethical duty, not only to the citizens of the Commonwealth, but also to the law enforcement profession to act ethically at all times in all situations, particularly when you're conducting a social and seizure. It is incumbent upon uh, law enforcement, it's incumbent upon the citizens, it's what the citizens demand of us. We have to respect the rights of the citizens we serve, and there are consequences for the violation of those constitutional rights through civil rights actions in both state court and in federal court. We emphasize ethical obligations at all times, particularly with respect to search and seizure. Now, what do we teach? I'm gonna go through a little bit of the background with behind the search and seizure requirements. In our intro to search and seizure class in basic training, which is a three hour course, we talk about what constitutes a search and seizure. What is a search? What is a seizure? We talk about that. Where does an individual have a reasonable expectation of privacy? And as we know, the most important reasonable expectation of privacy is a person's home or a person's person themselves, things of that nature. What does a person not have a reasonable expectation of privacy? We spend a significant period of time talking about that. We talk about an analysis on determining whether someone does have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a particular location, situation, things like that. Then we talk about what happens if you have to impound a vehicle. What do you do with respect to the inventory of a vehicle? Under Kentucky law, you only impound a vehicle when the driver has been afforded an opportunity to do so, and they're unable to do so because of the uh, uh, maybe an inability for a person to come get it. And it's pretty much a last chance opportunity. They're unable to do so and the vehicle's in a location where it's dangerous to others or it's dangerous to traffic. We stress that you only inventory a vehicle pursuant to a policy that the agencies have to create. If you don't have a policy, you don't get to inventory uh, search that vehicle. We talk about searches of persons in public facilities, such as courthouses. Well, somebody can walk into a courthouse and they may be subject to search. We talk about that. We talk about the exclusionary rule. We talk about the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. We talk about the good faith exception under the Leon decision. We talk about all of that. With respect to Terry stops and Terry frisk, we spend three hours with respect to Terry stops and Terry frisk. What's the difference between the two as described by the U.S. Supreme Court in Terry versus Ohio? Under Terry versus Ohio, a Terry stop is a reasonable suspicion that, a, that criminal activity has, is, or is about to occur by an individual based upon articulable facts. What we stress is, is we want you to be able to tell me exactly what that reasonable suspicion is at that particular time. Why, who, what, where, how. I want, I want to know as much facts as you can give me. And the reason for that is, is a judge is gonna ask you for as much facts as well. And uh, what is reasonable suspicion? It's based upon articulable facts. We talk about how long a Terry stop can last. We talk about with Terry Frisk, 
that a suspect has to be both armed and dangerous. We have a lot of discussion with respect to this standard on Terry Frisk that a person is both armed and dangerous. Also too, a Terry Frisk is not automatic. We talk about that in basic training. And what constitutes a Terry Frisk? A pat down of outer clothing using a flat hand and you don't manipulate objects unless it is immediately apparent that that object is contraband. With respect to Terry Frisk, we also stress that officer safety is not a legitimate justification. We want to know as many details as you can provide to us what those particular specific articulable facts are that the person is armed and dangerous in order to conduct a Terry Frisk. With respect to probable cause and warrants, we have a two hour class in basic with respect to that. First and foremost, we re-emphasize the duty to act ethically. Never, ever, ever put something in an affidavit that is false. Make sure that all the facts are there that is necessary to demonstrate the truth of that statement. Conclusory statements are not valid support. I wanna know when, where, what, why, how, when, all those questions. I wanna know as much facts as you can give me because you're gonna to need to put those in your search warrant affidavit. We wanna explain what probable cause is. How do you articulate probable cause? What facts specifically provide you with probable cause? And because the burden of proof is on law enforcement to provide that probable cause that would support that search warrant affidavit and that uh, search warrant that's ultimately issued. We talk about the components of search warrants. We talk about the probable cause uh, component in sig significant detail, that items are connected to criminal activity and will be found in the place, person, or thing to be searched. We talk about the components of an arrest warrant, that you have probable cause that a crime has been committed and the person to be arrested has actually committed that act. We talk about the service of search warrants and the service of arrest warrants. We talk about the knock and announce requirement as required by the U.S. Supreme Court in Wilson versus Arkansas. And we have them read the Wilson versus Arkansas case summary in order to understand what this requirement is. We also stress that the failure to knock and announce could lead to a civil rights lawsuit under 42 U.S.C. 1983. We also talk about the requirements of a no-knock warrant. Prior to Senate Bill 4, that was articulation of evidence to the officer or destruction of evidence. But now with Senate Bill 4 coming into effect next week, we are incorporating that information into the basic training curriculum. And also too, when Senate Bill 4 was uh, adopted by the General Assembly and enacted into law, when I go out and teach classes with respect to search and seizure or leadership classes, I recently taught a leadership class in uh, Bowling Green and I taught one up in Northern Kentucky. I made sure they had the information with respect to Senate Bill 4, including making a copy of the statute and handing it out to the class attendees. And I went over that in the legal review component that we have placed out with uh, basic training, with in-service training. And the legal review video is also available on DOCJT's website at this point. With this, also with respect to the execution of search and arrest warrants, we make sure that the recruits understand that they need to verify the correct location of the search warrant, what, where the location is to be searched, where the individual may be, arrest and proper description. We talk about the time of execution with respect to a search warrant. And while it doesn't necessarily need to be executed immediately, that search warrant was based on probable cause that those evidence at that location now. So if you let it wait, that evidence is going to dissipate. So while there's no set time limit, it may be necessary to go on ahead and execute that search warrant with due speed. With respect to the knock and announce requirement, we reiterate this again and again, and we also advise them to read the warrant out loud. I know some jurisdictions, some judges don't require that. We teach that. And the reason for that is that we want everybody to understand who's involved in this process, what exactly is going on. There's a search warrant going on, uh, there's an arrest warrant issue, things of that nature. That's why we go into that particular detail with respect to that. We also talk about where you can look with respect to serving a search warrant. The search may occur where the item may be located, whether you can detain persons at the scene, that that is permitted. The preparation of a search warrant return. 
what uh, materials did you find? What evidence did you find? We discussed that. And we discussed the manner in which they uh, complete the inventory, that they leave a copy of the inventory at the location that was searched. They also take a copy of the inventory and return it to the court. They also keep a copy for their investigation file. We make sure that they go over all the components of what they need to do when they need to do it. With respect to drafting search warrants, we talk about what elements a search warrant must contain. Facts that support probable cause that items or contraband or evidence connected to criminal activity will be found in or on the place, item, or person to be searched. These are the main components, and we want as much detail as you can possibly give us with respect to the uh, um, description of the evidence, why it's there, why you think there's probable cause, what have you. That's what we want to see. With respect to drafting the affidavit, we want to provide as much detail as we can concerning the uh, physical address to be searched, the location to be searched, the detailed description of the, ad, of the uh, property to be searched, things of that nature. If they're going to search a vehicle on the property, a detailed description, make, model, um, VIN number if available, color, things of that nature of the vehicle, and also describe what items you expect to find and why you expect to find them. Why is this item particularly uh, connected to criminal activity? Why may it be found on that at that place? What type of uh, surveillance have you done? What type of uh, information have you collected in order to support this search warrant? That's what we're looking for with respect to drafting search warrants. And we have them go through and draft a search warrant. We give them information in our uh, search warrant exercise book that we provide to them for this class. And they have a lot of information they go through and then they draft a search warrant. And here are those instructions for drafting a search warrant. We use the AOC forms for drafting a search warrant. And then they turn that into us and then we grade that, we turn that to them and uh, we go over the components and make sure that they get this right before they leave basic training. With respect to the affidavit, how did you get that information? Was it based on training and experience? What information do you have? The who, what, when, where, how, why requirements? Did you get information from a confidential informant? If so, what type of information did you get? How do you know that information is true? What's the basis of that knowledge? We want to know all of that information because we want to make sure that people do this the correct and proper way. Also, too, independent investigation. What type of independent investigation did you do? What surveillance? What, lo what location? What people did you talk to? Activities to be seized, uh, activities involved, items to be seized. Are they connected to criminal activity? Can you provide a reasonable and rational nexus to that item, the criminal activity? That's what we're looking for when we go through the drafting search warrant classes. And then they submit that warrant to us and we act as the judge in that situation to determine whether the search warrant was proper to be issued or not. And that's how we do the drafting search warrant class. In order to complete this class, the recruits watch a, uh, they draft a search warrant by using this manual and they also use a video that we have produced in place uh, in the training materials. With respect to warrantless searches and seizures, this is a four hour class where we talk about things like exigent circumstances, protective sweeps, and that protective sweeps are not automatic. Protective sweeps, you have to have some sort of facts that support that someone else might be in that location. We talk about hot pursuit. We talk about search incident to arrest. Where you can search a person incident to arrest. Can you search a room while you're, so, while you're serving a search warrant if you arrest a person in that room? How much of that room can you search? Things of that nature. What happens if you remove the arrestee from that room? Then that evaporates that search incident to arrest of that room. We talk about things of that nature. We talk about the Gantt rules for vehicle searches with respect to whether an individual has an actual possibility of accessing the vehicle or there's reasonable suspicion to believe that there's evidence of the crime in the vehicle um, where the arrestee was uh, located in at the time of the stop. We talk about carol searches, about the vehicle has to be in a public place where a law enforcement officer has a right to be. We talk about the probable cause requirement um, that goes along with searching a vehicle that's located in a public place. We talk about the length of canine stops, whether a canine can 
uh, how long you, uh, an officer has until they can get the canine unit there. They cannot impermissibly drag out the stop. Uh, we also talk about reasonable suspicion if something happens during the stop. When can that vehicle be searched pursuant to Terry? We talk about constructive possession. We talk about pretextual stops. We talk about evidence that may quickly disappear that's located on someone's body. Uh, we talk about now uh, the requirement of a blood draw with uh, the new case that came out of the Kentucky Supreme Court. Even though that's not final, we're starting to take a look at the McCarthy decision and figure out, okay, uh, search warrants for blood draws are going to require a warrant, it looks like, in the near future is what it looks like. We talk about McCarthy and what it ends up and what the responsibilities are for law enforcement. We talk about the fact that there's no crime scene exception to a search warrant requirement. And we reiterate this again and again and again. We talk about what are responsibilities for law enforcement with respect to traffic checkpoints and that traffic checkpoints cannot be used to uh, promote general crime control. It has to really be for safety of pedestrians on the highways, uh, for traffic, and to uh, enforce traffic safety laws. At the end of the search and seizure block with respect to uh, basic training, what we do is we have a two hour course that's called search and seizure analysis where we provide the recruits with numerous scenarios and go over those scenarios based upon everything that they have learned with respect to search and seizure law. And then at the end of the basic training academy, we have a practical called legal concepts and practice. And what we do is we bring everything together from search warrant service arrest warrant service, uh, traffic stops, Miranda, everything that they've learned at the academy, we go over in this four hour block and, they and we have them do practicals to go through it. Also too, we assist other sections with training. We assist Mr. West's section at tactics with a warrant service practical. And he's gonna get into details about how we do that. We appear at that search warrant practical. I send two attorneys up there, usually I'm one of them, and we observe the practical uh, take place. And then we're there to answer questions that they have during the practical. Or if we notice something, we'll stop and say, hey, you can't do that. That's something you can't do. We will do that. And the reason for that is we wanna make sure when they leave DOCJT, they get it right. We also have, uh, we also send attorneys to witness and participate in practices like consensual stops, school resource officers, I'm gonna do a school resource officer practical at uh, 3.30 this afternoon with the school resource officer section. Controlled substances practicals, we, do, we talk about that. And then some of the in-service trainings that we have. Uh, we talk about search warrants and drafting search warrants in the contemporary policing class. We talk about uh, search and seizure in the school environment. Court security officers, when are they permitted to uh, do Terry uh, stops, Terry frisks, things of that nature. Maybe they have to serve arrest warrants on occasion in open court. DEA updates, we talk about things of that nature there. Legal update blocks, we have a legal update uh, class going on today, and we're talking about some of the things we've already discussed here today. And I will, at this point, provide Mr. West some opportunities here to talk about what uh, tactics does. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Attorney General Cameron, Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, my name's Shannon West. I'm the uh, section supervisor for our tactics section over at uh, DOCJT. Uh, Doug, Doug was quite thorough in, in what he covered in terms of legal, so I'll try not to be redundant in some of the things that I cover there and just try to keep it to the meat of what we cover uh, over in the tactics section. I'll give you a little background on me. I, I retired from the Kentucky State Police was about just under 21 years. I retired as a lieutenant. I was an investigation commander at the um, Pikeville, B-Town, and Bowling Green Post, uh, just trying to work my way back home. Uh, and I uh, worked quite a few cases there, had extensive background investigations. I was with our SRT for a short stint, uh, learned quite a bit there, and uh, started teaching back in 2009. I taught our lieutenants in services on officer-involved shootings and things like that. Um, after that, I uh, made the mistake of opening a business down in the Smokies for about seven and a half years. That was a, a real experience. Then I come back to the academy. I've been here about six years. Um, we, we teach a number of things in my section and, and just a brief overview. I've got vehicle operations. We teach them how to drive. Active shooter response, counter ambush tactics, 
uh, traffic stop tactics and engagements and, and when things go really bad in and around vehicles, we teach them about those types of things. Uh, we got a TAC net and self-aid, teach them how to treat themselves uh, when they're injured in the line of duty if they get uh, involved in a gunfight. And, and even, I think, just as important uh, to provide uh, aftercare uh, for suspects or citizens or who, whomever they may encounter in some of the situations we get involved in uh, as police officers. Uh, with this particular uh, block of instruction, we got them for about four hours. Now, I'll tell you that, but I'll also tell you we got about 25 hours of total instruction just to get them the, the requisite skills that they need to get to the point where they can safely execute a warrant. And I'll go over some of those things. And, and, and again, I just want to get to the meat of it. Uh, I know your time's valuable. And, and hopefully I don't skip over something. I'm sure you'll have questions for me if I don't go adequately or, or get adequately uh, or give you the adequate information that you need. Um, the, um, our class starts out with the legal. A lot of the things he talked about, he, they're very thorough in, in all the concepts he just mentioned. Uh, and in the things that we look at in terms, we got, we got a practical where they'll do a search warrant in conjunction with an arrest warrant. So we put these things to work in terms of what it looks like. We break them up into groups and we have some scenarios set up uh, and we have actors and, and we try to stay consistent in terms of what they're, what they're dealing with. I'll tell you that we keep it on a very, very basic level. I'll tell you why. Because we're dealing with uh, officers that are coming from all over the Commonwealth, from cities and counties, and as much as our laws and the Constitution is the same, uh, you probably know as well as I do, in different jurisdictions, different things are em emphasized. I think they call it in the legal section, they call it home cooking. It's a little bit different. And you got departmental policies in different places that regulate what they can and can't do. So. We keep it uh, consistent in terms of, of current case law and just making sure they're acting within, con within the confines of those laws. And then the big thing for us is the tactics and how they're interacting with people you know, once they get on the scene. But more important than that, the things they're doing prior to getting to that scene and executing that warrant. And some of the things, and again, these things would be very familiar to you. They're, they're not rocket science, uh, but uh, on a very basic level, we will teach them uh, the foundational principles of, of tactics in general. Uh, you got to remember, I think, by the time we sift through, you know, uh, here in the Commonwealth and we try to get the best candidates we can, we, we usually end up with some pretty good people. Uh, and, and when they get into police work, many of them don't have any experience whatsoever. Uh, and we often, as instructors, have to remind ourselves just how fundamental and basic, you know, we got to keep the information uh, so that they can get it. So we'll break things down into... We'll talk about concepts such as cover and surveillance and reconnaissance. You know, we tell them, hey, you got to, if you're looking at an area uh, or someone that you're wanting to arrest, we, we need to surveil them. We need to know who they are. We need to gather intelligence, things like that. Reconnaissance of the area, making sure that we, we know what structures are there, what's the ingress and what's the egress, how, how are people getting in and out, uh, and, and everything related to that. And we got some checklists for them, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that here in, in just a minute. Uh, one of the concepts we teach them is restraint. Uh, we, we tell them that, you know, that's one of the things that's most often lost with officers is our restraint. You know, we, we rush in sometimes and, and we try to tell them, hey, hold back, get the information you need to make good, solid, sound de decisions. We emphasize that in every aspect uh, of our tactics. Uh, we talk about invisible deployment. You're not rolling up with your lights and siren going. You know, uh, that's not often needed. And sometimes that puts us at a real tactical disadvantage. Uh, creating dist distance, diagonal deployment, the element of surprise, and most important, and some, some people don't think about this in terms of a tactical concept, but it's communication. Communication with each other, communication with dispatch, communication with uh, the subjects that you're trying to talk to. I mean, that's one of the most foundational and fundamental principles. Um, as he said, we go over the knock and announce, hey, what's, what's that look like and what's it actually sound like? It's one thing to sit in a classroom and, and, and get a, you know, a lecture on, on the legal components but we put it into practice in terms of, you know, you're not going up there and whispering at the door. You're knocking and you're announcing and making sure the people inside know who you are. And we know that averts a lot of issues. Um, we talk about, and he went over this very thoroughly, administrative uh, considerations. We look at the paperwork and things like that that's required. And I'm not going to get too, too much into that. Uh, and, and executing and serving the search warrant. You know, the big things I know that we found as police officers over the years you know, what are they doing, what are they not doing in terms of the administrative stuff? You know, are they signing uh, things in the right places? Are they, are they making a return on the search warrant? 
Uh, they're filling out their citations and, and things like that. that. That's on the administrative side. Um, in terms of, um, I hope I got that memorized. Uh, I got it. We're good. Um, we give them a, what's called a threat assessment matrix. And, and maybe you've heard it. It's just a checklist. And, and some of the things we'll go over, we'll talk to them about the uh, assessment of the suspect, uh, the type of crime. I know this sounds very fundamental, but you know we're trying to get it in their head. Hey, you need to stop and take inventory of these things. Uh, you know, are they on probation or parole? Are they on the influence of drugs? Are they mentally ill? And we've all heard and known of, of many situations where officers get involved in that. And a lot of times it's on these warrants. Uh, we, we look at the offense itself. Uh, there's quite a difference between, uh, you know, an arrest warrant for homicide than there is assault fourth. So, you know, we tell them, hey, you need to stop and take into consideration those things. Um, violent felonies involved. Who are they associated with? Outlaw motorcycle gangs. I mean, you name it. We're, we're trying to. That's all in the intel gathering, and that's that's getting getting everything in preparation for the execution of these search warrants or arrest warrants. We look at the site assessment. And I mentioned that before. We look at things like dogs, children, the elderly. How many people are on scene, and things like that. And, and there's a whole checklist we've got for that. The time assessment. How. Uh, how time sensitive is this? Do we, is this something we need to act now or later? Now, now some of the things that we tell them there, you know, is cautionary. If, you, if you're forced into a situation where you're acting, having to act too quickly, what we know about human beings is we skip things. And we know that. And we try to teach those officers based on situations in the past and case studies and things we've talked about and they talk about very thoroughly. Well, we haven't done our due diligence. So we talk to them in great detail about those things. Weapons assessments. Uh, they're known to possess handguns. All these things, again, uh, are the, at, at the most fundamental levels uh, in terms of the tactics that we teach them. Um, we don't get much beyond that. And, and the reason is, it's been in my experience, and I know many of you who've been police officers, that's generally what we get. Uh, I, I can tell you on SRT, we serve some of the highest risk warrants there are for the federal government and others. And most of those, were, we had adequate planning. We went through all these things that we just uh, that I just talked to you about this that this threat matrix, and uh, most every one of those that I recall many many years ago went without incident. We were able to get what we needed in search warrants and arrest who we needed. Uh, uh, that we were, and th these are among the most dangerous people in our society. So uh, now I say that I give you this caveat, and I think all of you know it. And we tell our recruits this in class: uh, you can prepare as much as you want to. You can have the best training that, that there is uh, out there. And the thing is, there's there's two parts to this equation. There's what we do and what suspects decide to do when we get on the scene. That part, very difficult for us to control. We can try to get a heads up and figure out who they are, where they're coming from, uh, what types of obstacles and challenges we may face. But as well, uh, well most of you know, um, if they decide they don't want to go, I mean, things can get bad pretty quick, but we do our due diligence in covering everything we can to make sure they're well prepared to, to execute these warrants and search warrants. And I know that seems uh, pretty short compared to what Doug had, but it's just, it's pretty much that simple. And I would ask you, what questions do you have? Okay. Setting aside sort of exigent circumstances for serving of a warrant in terms of sort of the tactical mindset, is, is there an ideal situation or time in which to serve a warrant? I mean, have you all sort of in maybe group studies or, or what have you determined when, when is an ideal, you know, I, I can only speak from experience and, and, and of course, uh, every situation is a little different as you well know, uh, every, every, uh, uh, every structure is a little different. The people you're dealing with, yes, uh, we know we take due caution in terms of, you know, uh, warrants that we, we would serve late at night, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, sometimes you have to because sometimes they're time sensitive or sometimes you might have a violent felon, felon that, you know, it needs to be gotten. And again, in all your assessment, the time, that's part of that threat matrix. Yes, sir. That's a very important part of it in terms of assessing the risk for us and the risk to them and or anybody around them, if that makes sense. Yes, uh, um, 
to answer your question as a whole, I don't know if there's one time that you could identify. It's always contingent upon the circumstances that you have, sir. Did I adequately answer that? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Just, uh, All right. Curious. A few questions for me. Yes, um, so first on the tactics, you said that I understood the th uh, risk assessment yes. and it would include whether there are innocent bystanders in the home, children in the home. Absolutely. Um, does that, when you're training that, do you, is that solely about how to do the, the search warrant in the best way, or does it include the underlying question of should we even be doing a search warrant in this All the above, situation? sir. All the above. And, and we even go further in talking about, hey, what's, what's it look like, you know, in your surveillance and reconnaissance, you know, what are you looking for? If there's a bunch of toys in the backyard, you know, hey, uh, there's kids there. We've got to take that into consideration, you know, in, in, in terms of the type of warrant, you know, and, and then there's other tactics we teach them. You know, sometimes it's not best to, to, to get them at the house. Uh, sometimes it's best to wait till they leave. And, and of course there's considerations on that side because now they're in the public and you know, how dangerous are they? How likely are, are they to pose a risk to other people? But absolutely, those are critical things that we take into consideration. I can tell you at SRT, we, we looked at that. You know, are there elderly people? Are there, is there anybody else in that house uh, they could get caught up in something and, and, and you know, we're, you know, something could go bad. And, and we know that can happen no matter the best, best uh, planning, but we always took those things into consideration. We teach our recruits to do the same. I've got a couple questions for Doug. Okay. Um, so you talked about the training on the affidavit to make it complete and put all the relevant details in there. You know, in practice, there's always a kind of a, how much do I put in there? Um, and coming from defense counsel perspective, sometimes we see cases where we believe that the approach has been, what is the minimum amount I can put in here and still get the judge to sign it? Yeah, we. How I do you teach? I don't teach that. put the minimum amount in there. I teach put as much detail as you can because we need to have these judges understand throughout the Commonwealth why you need to intrude on someone's liberty and somebody's freedom. I feel like that if you do that, you shortchange the process. That's just my personal opinion. That's the reason why I teach it the way that I do. Okay. Do you provide any training uh, as to um, aggregation of, of data or retention of data? Because the only thing I saw as far as record keeping is returning the served warrant to the, to the clerk. Um, is it beyond the scope of your training as to what long-term data law enforcement agency sh agencies should be keeping in this? That's system. usually going to be considered by uh, policy and procedure. As far as I am aware, there is no state statute that requires this particular amount of information other than maybe the retention schedule, but the uh, libraries and records puts out. But other than that, um, no, it's really something that we tell them to rely on the agency's policies and procedures. Let, one more question. If I might, last question I have. Okay. If I were a police officer testifying getting ready to testify at a suppression hearing that was challenging a warrant I had done, the first thing I would do is pick up the phone and call you. Is that part of your function that you provide consultation if a law enforcement officer is going to have to defend a warrant? Can they call you and say, yeah, Here's I think, what happened. Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, before if somebody testifies to this question here, do they call me or call somebody on my staff and ask me how the, yeah. Is that uh, part of the function of your And uh, That is not our function. Our function is more of a training function. And if we get those phone calls, I tell them you need to hang up with me and contact your prosecutor. That's, how, that's what I do. I'm a trainer. Uh, I have I'm a not a prosecutor. I'm a trainer. Uh, I have some questions to ask. The right, is that? Yes, this is George right on Zoom. Uh, these are a couple of questions for Doug, um, uh, if you don't mind. First of all, I'd like to say I was very, very impressed with both presentations, the thoroughness of it, and, and, and the like. And I hope, um, uh, Doug, these questions are relevant to what you do. Uh, I was listening to all the comments that were made, how thorough you went into the laws um, uh, that guide us and so forth. Uh, I'm a history professor, and maybe this isn't relevant, but um, even if we say that today the law is colorblind in our society, if we made that point, I think we, there would be some point in the past, maybe we would differ on exactly when, that the law was not colorblind, that the Constitution, all those other things discriminated 
frankly, against African Americans. And so my, my question is, Ed, is there any place in the training, all that training, where you make people aware of what the law used to be like? And that then, is it possible that some of that could still be part of us today? Uh, I, I, I was just wanting to, you know, for instance, when you say search warrants are given, how many of those are ultimately for black people, white people? Then what does that look like percentage-wise in our population? Uh, the discretion that is such an important aspect of our legal system has not always worked to the advantage of minorities. In fact, it's worked to their disadvantage in that regard. So, so I just wonder, do we talk about what we used to be like, if, assuming that we're not like that today. You want to take the post? I'd be glad to take that. Uh, if you're asking me if there's something in our curriculum, I'm not aware of, of a history of law enforcement in that respect, sir. I can tell you that, that the, the assumption is made is that when we enforce the law, and I know in, in all the years I worked for the state police, it was about criminal behavior in criminal activity, the, stat, the, the stats you mentioned, I, I don't have them in front of me. Uh, I'm sure they're out there in terms of, you know, uh, arrests and warrants and things like that, uh, where you can get information regarding that. But we, uh, we had it based on the law, based on human beings' behavior, absolutely not the color of their skin. That's, that was never the consideration in, in terms of what I did for over 21 years and what I can tell you here at the academy uh, it's just about whether or not you violated the law, period. So no mention is ever meant, said that it is possible or, or how do we make sure that prejudices or biases or presumptions or none of that is built in? You just strictly go with other things. We say nothing about any of those things in the training that we do a little class too when we first get the recruits the first person that they see when they come through the legal training section any of our classes is me and the first class that we have is a u.s constitution in the role of law enforcement class and i go through the constitution and uh, the things that the, the entire constitution the entire bill of rights uh, all the amendments what the functions of government are supposed to be and I do talk about the fact that, that the Constitution uh, did have some elements of uh, protection of wealthy landowners back as they were in 1776 when the Constitution and when the Independence Code and when the Constitution arose. I do talk about that. But I also talk about things like the Fourth Amendment, uh, about the uh, 14th Amendment, due process, equal protection. I do talk about that. I do talk that it's incumbent upon law enforcement to ensure that we protect the equal protection due process rights of all people and that you leave your biases and your prejudice at the door when you do this job because society requires you to do that. One of the things that I do tell them when I teach official liability, because I teach the law of official liability, 1983 liability, is that you are a reflection of the community under which you serve. And if you act prejudicially, if you act discriminatorily, if you engage in that behavior, that's how people are going to look at your community. And that's the reason why I teach that. And I tell them that there's no room in this profession, at least for this type of behavior. Thank, thank you. Question, sir. Any other questions? Is the basic training is clear. What about our in service? Uh, we have an officer, 10 years of service. Is there uh, uh, refresher, intense course on the very topic? No, of course, it's got an intense uh, search warrant and writing requirement where they'll go through all the things, and uh, it's more of like a refresher and it is a requirement part of it. Then we have a legal review uh, two hour components that we push out to several of the in service classes. We have officers who come in for legal updates occasionally where they'll take a uh, 24 hour class and legal update to update themselves on the penal code and things of that nature. And then there's a 16 hour constitutional procedure. 
that way can come in and they can get a refresher on constitutional procedures and policies and things of that nature. So uh, we do uh, have incorporations with respect to that. Uh, any type of, of uh, training that may be specialized in nature, like interrogations, we have a legal block that deals with the law of interrogations. Uh, any type of legal block, like human trafficking, we talk about the new human trafficking statutes that were enacted a couple of years ago by the General Assembly, things like that. We uh, also, we have uh, our legal updates are posted now on our website, so you don't have to go through, uh, you don't have to be scheduled for a particular training class to receive them. They're available year round at, at any officer, any member of the public at their convenience. Um, they can get on the DOCJP website to see the legal updates. And they will be updated um, quarterly as needed. Anyone else? Mr. Barnett, you guys, thank you all so much. Thank you, for, thank uh, you sir. Thorough, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right, well, if everybody's ready to, to, to move on here. Um, at this juncture, uh, we are going to uh, have a panel discussion with some uh, local folks from Madison County. And, um, oh, thank you for passing those out. These are just the, uh, I believe, the drafts of the, that Ms. Dudgeon was yes. speaking of earlier. So make sure everyone gets one of these. Does everyone have one? And, and for those that uh, are watching via Zoom, how will we, we'll, up, we'll make sure that We'll make sure if you're watching uh, via Zoom that you you get one of these. Uh, if not right at this moment, we'll get it to you via email. So Andrew King will be working on that. All right. Um, so this uh, local panel of folks from Madison County are going to discuss the search warrant process uh, in this part of uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, and to begin the conversation, our office has submitted several questions to the panel. These questions will obviously just help facilitate the conversation. Uh, but you all um, here as members of the task force should feel free to ask any questions uh, of your own. Uh, and I believe all of you have a copy of those questions I just referenced. So at this point, I will introduce uh, the panel. Uh, B. Scott West, who is the uh, Deputy Public Advocate for the Kentucky Department of Public Advocacy. Good to see you. Uh, Hassan Davis, former Juvenile Justice Commissioner. Uh, Scott McIntosh, Madison County Sheriff's Office, sir. Uh, and uh, Mr. O'Donnell uh, with the Richmond Police Department. So thank you as well. And then uh, representing the County Attorney's Office here is uh, Ms. Kristen Klaus as a assistant uh, county attorney. So thank you uh, as well. And I don't know if you all want to take a brief moment just to add a few words of introductory remarks yourself, or if you want to jump right into some of these questions. All right. Well, uh, if you all don't mind, if you can just uh, describe the process utilized or experienced by uh, your office in determining whether and when to uh, seek a search warrant, and if applicable, applicable uh, detail any pre-warrant investigation. Well, as I said, uh, I'm the Christian Police Department, so we have many variables that for each agency that I'm in. Without the town, as long as long as different agencies, we just all generally go the same. Uh, for us, uh, based on your question there, well, the officer will review the investigation with the supervisor um, and see if it fits the criteria uh, to continue the investigation and see if the probable cause is there. Um, that's part of our pre war investigation. We actually go through a checklist um, with the officer uh, that the supervisor controls the board to make sure all the, the facts are documented as they should be. Um, Mr. West uh, mentioned earlier, you know, another part of our um, process is the surveillance um, of residents uh, to see uh, exactly what is going on there. Also, the criminal history checks to see the who we're dealing with. Um, we 
also would be uh, past all service compliance, so on and so forth, depending on what the investigation is. Uh, surveillance. Um, do you conduct maybe just a day of surveillance prior to? I mean, how how much surveillance do you do? That yes, sir. I think it's specific to the the type of uh, the next response for security for the investigation. I would add uh, to what they've already discussed. It's a multi-layered system as well uh, with the Sheriff's Department, uh, a lot like Richmond Police Department. There's a layering process there that once the information is obtained, it's, it's reviewed by a first-line supervisor uh, that extends on uh, eventually to a second-line supervisor and even a third-line supervisor, depending on what the case uh, scenario is and the investigation where it leads. So there's a multifaceted system in that as well as I'm, I'm sure a lot of agencies do the same thing, but uh, before it gets to the county attorney's office to proceed uh, with possibility of uh, being granted. And obviously we don't issue search warrants, but the first thing we do when we see a search warrant mm -hmm. is make a determination as to whether or not the four corners of the affidavit support the request for the warrant. That can be difficult. And it's difficult because by the time that you're challenging a search warrant, uh, you, you've talked to your client, you may have talked to a police officer, there may have been a preliminary hearing, and you've accumulated a lot of knowledge about the case that's not in that affidavit. And the exercise that we go through is, if all I know, and the only thing the judge knows, should be what's in this affidavit, does that amount to probable cause? And if it doesn't, then we challenge uh, the search. But I have to say that most of our time is spent in warrantless searches where we are trying to find if the use by the police department or the sheriff's office, if the use of an exception to the warrant requirement was, was reasonable or unreasonable, and if all of the necessities that they have to have in order to avail themselves of an exception to the warrant requirement are present. There's a question from your perspective more broadly about the search warrants and Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, the frame I came in this afternoon with uh, was along the lines of these questions, but as I heard the conversation earlier, it really gave me some space to reflect. Uh, and so there are three things that I really like to, to, to highlight. Uh, Director Dudgeon had the question about the database for the state. And as soon as I heard the answer, uh, no, that, that created some real concern. If we can't track it, we don't know what we're doing. The conversation that came later about if we track by race, if we track, you know, the number of search ones to go out, if we can't track how many people we actually send warrants out on that come back negative, then we don't know. The judges can't really make a decision about whether a jurisdiction is actually doing due diligence when they, when they, when they draw these up. That really just struck me as a really powerful piece as far as how we as a commonwealth can show the rest of the world that we are, are taking care of not targeting people, not identifying people unfairly, and not moving them into a system where they shouldn't be. And I think that's really critical. Uh, when we talked about the idea of training, uh, one of the trainers used the great word, home cooking. And I think that that is so much of what my experience has been. And, and I'll be clear, in, in addition to being Commissioner of Juvenile Justice, I was Vice Chair of the Federal Commission on juvenile justice for the states and territories for three years. 
chair of Kentucky's Juvenile Advisory Board for 10 years under three governors, but I'm also a victim and a member of this system. My first arrest at 11 years old, two brothers serving life sentences. I buried five cousins, the youngest 14 when he was shot between the eyes. I've been, unlike I imagine many of you, the target of search warrants and the target of fair and unfair warrants. And so I have this arc that may be very different when I have this conversation. But if we, and this is the stance that I took as commissioner of an agency with responsibility to the Commonwealth and its people, if we are training people to do a job and we can't hold accountability to those folks once they leave our training to do that same job in action, live, then we fail. And one of the last things I would tell our new trainees as they graduated into the work was that if you follow the expectations of the training branch, then you have the full weight and support of this government system behind you. If you go home and someone tells you, like we know in all of our jurisdictions they do, that's not how we do it around here. Wink, wink. I'm gonna show you how we really get the job done. Then you don't have our support. And my experience in law enforcement the last 20 years is too often we have seen bad actors step into the work representing us doing bad things and they'll still, us still saying, well, we got to protect them. We still got to look out for them because that's who we are. And the first time I called the state trooper on a person in the system that was not doing the work of the Commonwealth, the whole system was surprised. Why would we do that to our people? Well, if they're not doing the job of serving and protecting, they're not our people. They are a pariah. They are abusing our role and making us look better. So I think that it's really important as you all make these decisions and really talk about this, we, we have the, the, the conversation about who we want the world to see when they see enforcement, when they see us show up. Are we allies? You know, or are we just whatever that last person who came to them and didn't follow the expectation that we had. And so I think there's a lot in there. And the last piece of clear thought, and I'm ADHD, and so I got 85 other things in my head. The last piece was about whether we actually intentionally train folks on bias. And I think that our system assumes a lot about the people who come to this work, and, and we should but we should not assume they know and understand the expectations of treating everyone the same way because our history and our story tells us it's not the case. And that's just the truth. I graduated, I finished my very first semester of law school, went to the bus station in Lexington to take a ride home to finally see my family and wound up in an altercation with six police cars full of officers because I was that guy sitting in front of the bus station waiting for a bus like all the other people. That, that's not how we create the system that we deserve. And so I think that understanding bias and allowing our officers to understand that we have an expectation, not a hope, not an assumption, but an expectation that they carry themselves at the highest level. You know, I've had the opportunity to interact with law enforcement in, in the Madison County areas. I've lived here for 30 years, and, and, and they have been amazing because I've built relationships and I've been able to see some, some people who are willing to step up and do and say the things that they know ought to be done and said. But I, I don't think we ought to make the assumption that everybody is doing that. And I think the most powerful piece of this that we're talking about, you know, from, from search on, is you all with the, with, the, with the authority and the power you're vested in being able to set that standard, being very clear that there are no exceptions, that there are no second days, no, no bad. This is the expectation of how we, how you carry out the will of the Commonwealth in a way that allows people to have faith and trust in us that when we do show up at the door and it's very urgent, they know we're showing up for the right reason and that we're showing up for, in the right way to make sure that justice is served and, and nothing less than that. So that, that's, that's what came to me now. So I'm gonna take a deep breath and, and thank you all for the opportunity to be in this conversation. But I, I, I think that one, I'm very appreciative when I saw that the task force was being formed and that this is a conversation that is actually live in the Commonwealth now after so much has gone on. And, and I appreciate the chance to be in the conversation with you and, and, and to be on this panel with, with folks uh, in my community who are doing amazing work. Thank you.
Mr. Davis, for those um, uh, very powerful uh, but important remarks as well. Uh, I, I think it is important that we have, and this is to, to Damon's point that you made uh, at the last meeting, which was that you know we need to have uh, folks who have seen both sides of of the coin uh, be a part of this conversation. So I, I appreciate you making that mention, Mr. Davis. I appreciate you telling and sharing some of your story and how it will uh, provide insight to the conversation uh, that we're having at this table. Along those lines, um, if I may, um, I want to uh, turn back uh, to our officers. Mr. Davis talked about a lot about, and I think this goes to your point and the point Mr. West was making about, you know, looking in the four corners of the document. Uh, Ms. Klaus as well, you're involved in this process after the investigation unfolds. How do you ensure that there is enough, that there's continuity and, and consistency in terms of when those affidavits are put together, uh, when those investigations are done, that you're, there is the appropriate amount of information there and that it's consistent amongst all of your, whether it be at the sheriff's office or the police department. I mean, how do you all make sure that that high standard is met? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the communication throughout the, the different agencies. And, um, you know, with Ms. Klaus' office, um, we know what they, ex we know their expectations whenever we um, bring a search warrant an affidavit up there for them to review and also with our judges that partnership with our judges we know our judges uh, very well and we know what they expect of us in our investigations and um, you know going back to the supervisors that I have specifically at our department um, who have been there for you know significant amount of time they're familiar with that and it, they re relay it on down to our, our officers that are on the beat and we train them in that way and saying hey this is this is what is expected of you. This is a thorough investigation. If it's not a thorough investigation, that's part of our, our checklist plan we implemented, um, then go back and investigate further until you get that information that you need to make a, a good solid case and present, say, a search warrant for review and uh, eventually signed by a judge. If that answers your question, sir. Do you have anything? Uh, yes, one thing that I would like to point out too is when, uh, you know, when we're talking about the probable cause, um, standard, uh, I err on the side of the gentleman that asked earlier of uh, of everything being put in it. The the basis of having a minimal standard is is uh, uh, not a great standard to go by. It should be the more the, the better uh, as far as that goes because you're establishing uh, why you believe that you're going to find what you're looking for. And then once it gets to the county attorney's office and to be reviewed there, you know, we're filling out an application, an affidavit to, to apply for one. Therefore, that's not to say that it is or that it will be granted or not. It's our it's our duty to uh, serve the public in a way that we are uh, err on the side of caution that the information there is not only correct, but it's uh, overwhelming to some degrees. When we get it, most of the time, like Mr. West said, that they have a lot of information when they go forward. We don't, might not, we might, this might be the first search warrant that's been part of that investigation. So we can be that fresh set of eyes to look at it and say, hey, wait a second, I, I don't, I'm missing a jump that you've made. And the officer can then go back and say, well, it's because I didn't include this, I need, I need to let you know this, or well, I need to go back and do some more investigation. So we can look at it in that way so that law enforcement can make a better search warrant to then give to the judge to make a determination. Oh, one of the things that we teach our attorneys, and, and when we say we, I'm the one that teaches search and seizure for DPA. Uh, you have to go beyond the affidavit to this extent. You can have a perfectly sound affidavit and a perfectly sound warrant and someone who has indeed committed a crime. That doesn't answer the question about whether these search warrants are being predominantly sought on one race. You can't look at the case by itself. You have to look at other cases. And if, if you find that there are a number of search warrants and they're all in one neighborhood where there is a predominant race, but they're not other places, then you have to ask yourself, do I go beyond just trying to get the search warrant suppressed? Do I also look for an equal protection violation, uh, which our Supreme Court has said, uh, you have to go into uh, uh, 
prove a selective prosecution, and that's what they say the remedy for profiling is. It is a selective prosecution dismissal of the entire case, not just suppression of the evidence. So we're not done once we've looked at the search warrant. We have to know the context, the broader, the broader uh, space in which search warrants are being issued. And that's something I'm not sure is being done outside of a defender level. I don't know who in law enforcement, who in prosecution, who in the judiciary is keeping that score uh, because I only see the ones I'm appointed to. I, you know, without extra efforts, including private counsel's help, uh, I'm not going to have the whole entire picture as to whether or not uh, one race is being, for lack of a better word, targeted. So that goes into our analysis as well. Do you all, um, DPA, do you all, when you all come on as a um, representing um, a, a defendant, um, at that point, do you keep sort of statistics or data of those individuals once you are representing them so that, you know, it might not be the whole pie, but it would give you some indication of perhaps who uh, you're representing and, and you know, the, the challenges that might come along with the search warrants in, in those particular situations? I would say that varies office to office, depending on the what you have. I know that I've personally paid attention to that, but not part as an overall uh, endeavor. Uh, and I, I did uh, I did look to see whether or not I was getting a predominant mm -hmm. uh, in one area. Uh, that said, I don't know that our data set up for that. Quite frankly, my my boss, Mr. Preston, could speak more That's why I kind of intelligently about what <laughs> data we have as a state level than I could on that. Yeah, our, our system doesn't track things, specific acts like search warrants and investigations, but we do have uh, a statewide data system that captures uh, the race and gender and age of, of every client we have. And so we can certainly do uh, reports and have done reports mm -hmm. on charges and counties, uh, but things like the details here, like where searches are conducted, the outcomes of those search warrants, we wouldn't have that kind of information. I don't want to monopolize with, with questions. So if other members have them, um, feel free to answer, ask them at any, any point. All right, I'll, I'll ask a, another one then. Um, in terms of, of challenges, and Mr. Davis, you sort of alluded to some of the challenges. I don't know if you want to expound upon that at all or if any of you all want to talk, whether it be from the, the law enforcement perspective or or defense or or otherwise, um, what are some of the challenges that exist in, in, within this process? If, if, if you can be talked about at all. And any of you all can. Well, I, I think that some of the, the challenges that I that I see that I hear of most often. I, I work a lot in Eastern Kentucky, but lately, especially with returning citizens and young people who were transitioning through these systems, um, is that communication is key. That uh, trust is key, and, and 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 these are from folks who already are felons, already coming out of rehab, but they they still want to trust. That, that when law enforcement shows up, it's not just because I know you and I know your family, right? I know your granddaddy and know what he used to do. And I think that there's a lot of community building that, or rebuilding that I, that I, I believe law enforcement can do. And it, and it doesn't jeopardize uh, their stance as being a, a neutral party in the community. But this is just about being community members, right? You know, to serve a community, to protect its citizens, you know, is front and center. And what I've seen, and I try to keep it in my own experience, what I've seen as an, as, an, as an advocate and a coach working with these young folks is they don't feel like, you know, law enforcement can see anything but who they were. And so I think that I always say there's this thing we have to hold, this present vision and this possible vision. So even as we're looking at that individual and in this moment of crisis, whatever it is, still being able to see and recognize them as members of our community that ought to be valued because their grandmama is, is, is scared for them every time something happens too, because we go to church with, you know, their cousin Frankie, 
you know, those are all really valid things. And, and my sense is that so much of law enforcement been told to divest themselves of being human in their community. And, and we know that community policing, being known in the community is such a huge advantage to law enforcement, to, to be known as a part of the community, as someone who doesn't just show up when, when the fire starts and when things get really bad, but they're showing up you know, at the park and seeing people engage, they're showing up at church and, and helping out and being part of the water brigade, you know, that, that, that's helping somebody build that train line. Then we know you're here. And I think that a lot of that has been shelled away, especially under the, the guise of budgets and issues, from my experience, coming through this system, right? We had to get rid of all that community stuff because we had to focus just on policing, but the community stuff is really the heart in so many ways of what good policing is. Anybody else? Yes. Question of the law enforcement. Just since we're talking about, and we heard about Senate Bill 4, um, are no-knock warrants a thing for your agencies, and will Senate Bill 4 affect your practice? Uh, no. it, not for us. I, I don't know that, uh, at least in the last 10 years, it, it's ever been an issue, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I, you know, I don't know that that, uh, is with Richmond or not, but I, I can say from the Sheriff's Department, it's not. Mm -hmm. No, sir, we, uh, to answer your question, we haven't, to my knowledge, and I've been there 18 years, I've never participated in a no-knock warrant in 18 years. Um, so, no, it's not an issue for us. We, we carry on as we, we normally would. It's not a problem. My experience, uh, not only as a uh, private attorney, but as a member of the uh, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Uh, we've got a whole process and program on implicit bias. And my question, um, I guess, goes not only to this panel, but would go even, even back to the training segment, would be, are we, given the light of the situation, I think there's a disconnect somewhere between the training, which seems great, and the application, which is probably what caused the formation of this task force, is that are we are we doing anything about training um, not only our officers but the other people involved in this process about implicit bias and the fact that we all have biases whether we realize it or not just in the culture that we're raised up in the people we've been trained by the people we've met um, and I, I learned that a long time ago back in nineteen in the night early well mid nineteen eighties when I went to the College of Law Enforcement here that those kinds of things existed then. Are we doing anything across the board, not only with our officers, but with our county attorneys, with the other people, the judges that are in this process? You know, uh, candidly, and I'm not going to call anybody specifically, it would not be good for my career, but I've seen judges that have biases. And uh, are we doing anything to address that? Um, we've got, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the last year's in service training that was mandated. Um, we've got implicit bias training but i think that's you know that's a it's a challenge you know i i really want to focus our training on meaningful training um and it's you know i'm i'm hoping that as we continue to move forward um, as a country through these challenges that we can really work to find meaningful bias training and i say that because i don't want it to be just training that sounds good on paper that if, it, if we're going to be training these things, that it's actually has some, some effect on, uh, on the other side. But uh, no, we certainly, uh, DOCJT, we certainly address implicit bias. We openly discuss that. It's kind of woven in throughout the practical training, but there's a specific part of our the basic training that addresses that. Part of, what prompt, part of what prompted that question was yesterday, I was just going through the TV and there was a whole documentary on the Rodney King incident. Of course, this has been so it's been going on my entire career, which is almost 30 years ago. And and I, I wonder sometimes what steps we've made to get there. And and so I'm just concerned that you know, I understand what you mean by meaningful. I don't want to do something that's just fluffed and doesn't have any merit or or issues, but I don't think there's any question that we have some issues in our society that we have to deal with. And I'm just wondering how how we go about implementing that into that training or that process. Well, if I could, um, 
you know, we, we actually have a policy related to, to bias training, but more to what this gentleman said, um, I think it is engaging with our community probably helps us more than anything. You know, I, I speak for Richmond uh, alone, but you know, we've hired, uh, you may be familiar with Dr. Aaron Thompson. He's come in and done trainings with us in the past. And, and so, and um, you know, we, we've done that frequently and we've uh, done it, you know, with every new officer that's come in and so forth, but getting the, um, the engaging with community and, and getting the community to know who we are as a person. So when I get out of my cruiser, I'm not, you know, Officer O'Donnell, I'm BJ and so on. So um, I think that plays a, a, a lot into it, going back to what he said a few minutes ago. I'll go back and leave it with this and the last thing, and it just goes to this whole discussion, but back when I was in the College of Law Enforcement here at Eastern, I did a, one of my research projects was to do an attitude towards policing mm -hmm. in Boone County compared to Covington, because I was substitute teaching at the time in Covington and in Boone County. And in Boone County, it was the kids and the responses were, they're my friends, the police officer, we love them. If we get in trouble, we go to them, we'll reach out to them. That's who I go to for help. And in Covington, it was totally a different story. It was, they took my brother away. Um, they arrested my mom. I'm told not to trust them or to, to treat them with any kind of, um, uh, always watch them with a suspicious eye. And I thought that was amazing because the, the research was from kids. It wasn't from adults or defendants, it was from kids. So I think that does go to what you're saying. It really is a cultural thing within the community yes, and goes to community policing as much as enforcement policing, if that makes sense. I'll go over to Director Thank you, Sir, if I may speak, uh, when I came through the door, uh, a lot of people were wondering, well, who are you and why are you here? Well, I am, my father's from Richmond, my mother's from Berea, and her father was named after the founder of Berea College. So uh, I tried to get a teaching job here in Kentucky, and I couldn't get one, so somebody said, would you like to work in Miami? And I said, Beaches and Disney, where do I sign? And so I've been away for about 30 years and I ended up as an assistant principal in Miami and I was on the board of directors for the Children's Services Council before it became the Children's Trust and also the Department of Juvenile Justice District 11. And I learned that you can take the zip code and find out everything that you need to know about a population. So uh, it was offered for a recommendation. I don't know if there's been a recommendation made to get the data or allocate the resources to do that type of analysis. I think that would be a good idea. I don't know who on the uh, council uh, would make that recommendation so that that can be moved forward. But um, uh, we talked about implicit bias, you know, a lot of the new buzz terms. Uh, another one that I didn't hear was systemic racism. Uh, my great great grandfather was actually out there by Bluegrass Armory. We did a celebration for him at the Berea College, uh, the Berea Cemetery. Uh, he was uh, enslaved actually here in Madison County and uh, got on with the Union uh, Army and uh, actually 
ended up with over two, 300 uh, acres of land. So what I'm saying is that we have, and I want to be brief, and I thank you for allowing me to speak, is that I love Kentucky. I'm from here. I was born at Greer College Hospital, and my family has a lot of history here. So especially when I see officers, I always tell them, thank you for your service. And uh, I don't know how many members of the public we here, have here attending, but a lot of the information from the great presentations that you had and your training. My question was, when you were speaking, was are you actually training us or actually how many of the law enforcement people here have had your training? And um, who would that information be available to? Because as an old teacher, Whenever I see some, something good that we need to know, I try to get a copy of it, but I know you have to get paid for your information and for whoever you sell it to so that you can do that training. I understand that. But um, I think that we're sitting on a gold mine right now. Uh, Eastern Kentucky University is the preeminent training ground for law enforcement. We have the opportunity to have the head law enforcement person here with us right now and we have a lot of great law enforcement people and the juvenile justice people here. Um, I, I, I did a co-op at Kentucky State University when I was in school, and um, I did work at Blackburn Correctional. And then I went to one of my fraternity brother's houses um, over there by Blackburn, and uh, when Kentucky was playing Louisville, and when I left, I said, let me just make that left instead of going back home to the right. And let me just pass by Blackburn and see what's going on. And it kind of hit and struck me in my heart to see that facility for youth over there. And it was kind of like criminal mentoring. You know, you have a facility for youth in walking distance from a correctional facility. I didn't think that was a good idea, but let me, let me just end up by saying, I, I came back home to be a resource because I learned so much uh, when I, in my 30 years of being not only in the education system, but also dealing with youth and law enforcement and the juvenile justice system. I think that especially in Richmond, you know, when we talk about um, issues of race, I, I think, I, I said, well, if, if there's 35% African American in Miami, and then I come back home and there are only about 3% African American in the city of Richmond, then that will be a very quickly solvable issue. And then we can move forward and use resources to help Anglo children or uh, Chinese children or everybody else so, so that we, you know, we need to mature past the race issue. We need to mature past the race issue because I don't think anytime soon that white people are gonna take over America or black people are gonna take over America. I think that we as just people, I think I heard somebody say uh, human uh, beings, as, as humans, it was your partner that said that we need to be able to get, at some point, get to solving human problems. You know, I know that race is, is, is an issue, but at the same time, I think that as adults and as, as us men, you know, we just had Father's Day, I was looking at men who have children, you know, and, and, and um, economically, uh, I, I, I'm lucky to have a, a, about an acre of land on Irving Street and Hill Street. And I'm looking at building uh, a, a Whole Foods or something where we can employ people, where we can have, start to develop downtown Richmond economically. My son said, uh, Dad, uh, why would you even think of building something like that downtown Richmond? I said, son, because if you remember when we lived in Miami, there was a place called Wynwood where I taught middle school, and it was a dilapidated area, but now it's one of the richest areas in Miami. When we start to give the population, you know, Granny and Billy and Tyrone and those people an opportunity, you know, uh, we, we had a black school and a white school in Richmond, but now we only have Madison Center. And I really, and I, I hope Gladys is probably not on TV. I see Ms. Jones over there. But to, to, to give these kids the ultimate opportunity to be able to participate economically, 
because the street that I live on, thank God that I made enough money in Miami to come back home and to be able to live a couple of doors down from one of the um, higher ups in the state police, who is, who's, who's not black, but he's my neighbor. And we all enjoy living in that community and raising our children together. You know, and I'm sorry that I took up so much time, but we have so many resources right in front of us, right here at this table, that we can change Richmond and use Richmond as a model to change the rest of Kentucky and the rest of our country. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. If I, if I could, I'd, I'd like to address what he said very briefly, if you have a moment. Um, there are currently five academies across the state, uh, KSP, Lexington, Louisville, and Bowling Green, and us. So the, the, the other four academies each service an individual agency. So DOTJT, we're responsible for the specific, we generally use about 430 other agencies across the state. We're available to all of them, but the other agencies have their own academy. So when you ask about the material that uh, uh, Mr. Barnett presents, that a vast majority of law enforcement in the state of Kentucky gets their basic training to do the CJT in Richmond. Um, our in-service is also available to all uh, police officers in Kentucky. So that's the audience that would receive the information that Mr. Barnett presents. So thanks. Oh, and may, may I address his point very briefly? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the, the last two speakers uh, specifically because this is something that um, among the securing committee I'd, I'd like to get into, and this is the building of a search warrant statistical map. Mm -hmm. This is a way of identifying specifically where warrants are requested, who's requesting them, which judges are authorizing them, and where they're being executed. And you can break that down literally to the zip code level. So I, I think we're talking in very esoteric, generalized terms about some of the problems that, that society faces generally and how it blends into the search warrant process. But what we're doing in the task force has to be data-driven. And I think if we build a statistical map, we will have the data from which we can actually build some important recommendations for the attorney general. So, so I appreciate the, the comments of the, the last two speakers because it focuses us on, I think, where we need to be, this idea of identifying the data and then building our analysis from there. So, so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I, I realize we're running out of time. This is George Wright. I had spoken about an hour ago, and, and I would like to say that I really do appreciate the comments that our member, Mr. McGee, has made. Um, the comments that Mr. Davis on the panel made and the comments of the other panel members because what they have shown us is the point that I was trying to make. The laws are very good laws. The laws are very fair laws. There's, there's no argument there, but when it comes to who is implementing the laws, they can do that. Someone said a moment ago that they, they have mixed feelings about implicit bias training. I, I can I can share those, but I, here's what I would say. Have you instead just read various laws that Kentucky itself passed? Kentucky once passed a 30-day cooling off law from when a person was found guilty and then he was executed because so many black people were put to death. Have you read the United States Court of um, a decision of Baston versus Kentucky, 1986, where it talked about the use of preemptive challenges to keep black people from serving on juries as late as the 1980s. So th there are a lot of legal things that we can look at in addition to these things. But if we don't consistently talk about race and whether or not race has been a part of this, then we're wasting a lot of time. That's why we're here, and we have to acknowledge that. I didn't say, I say it now, I'll say it again. I did not say we did not say it, did not say it, did not but I do know it once was in the past, and I'm, so just tell me when did it end? You see, I'm okay with if you say it ended, but if you, if you deny that these things were a part of it, then you're not understanding what Mr. Davis and what Mr. McGee said that they themselves have experienced. 
and they're sitting in this room with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, and thank you to the panel again. Really appreciate your time and input. Uh, it's helpful, as you can see, to spark this uh, longer conversation. Thank you, sir, as well, for your remarks. Uh, at this point, we're going to, to do um, what uh, Mr. McGee and others have talked about is break up into our committees on securing, serving, and reviewing subcommittees. So uh, you all know this is going to be where most of the lion's share of the work is. Uh, we'll allow you to break up into your groups. I know that there are small uh, breakout rooms uh, available to us uh, on, uh, on the side of the... Uh, we'll give you some time to get a chairperson uh, elected. Uh, a, uh, our staff, Attorney General staff, uh, will be available to help you in writing in minutes. We want to make sure that we're consistent with the, uh, the uh, meeting requirements, our open meeting laws. So we'll have somebody in the, off, in the room that will help in, in writing the meeting uh, minutes and assisting you in any other way that you might need. Uh, so at this time, we'll break for those committee meetings and uh, we'll see you all. How long should we break for? <laughs> Yeah, so we'll do about probably 30 minutes in total and then come back here. So thank you all.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, make sure we get you all um, on the road by four because I understand there might be some more weather coming in. Uh, one housekeeping matter is uh, we need to approve the minutes from our, our May meeting. So I know all of you have copies of it. Uh, all right, make a motion. Anybody second that? Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor of approving uh, the May minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. It appears the ayes have it, so uh, we'll approve those minutes. Um, I know that you all just came out of your committee meetings. I don't know if there's anyone in particular that wants to share briefly sort of what occurred. Um, maybe the chairperson of each committee can just say a few words if possible. Um, I'll speak for the securing committee. Um, really, the, the primary uh, focus of our first meeting was to acknowledge that uh, we really need more data, and the data needs to drive, uh, at least in the initial part, uh, to drive the direction that we go. Um, so part of the, the data that we identified that we needed to, um, to have across the state of Kentucky, where and who and, and what frequency are search warrants being sought and, and served? Um, acknowledging that across the state, depending on population density, um, that that number may vary quite a bit. So we need to know where in the state uh, in order for us to, to start to focus. Uh, one of the other issues, uh, the training, uh, being that there are five separate academies that deliver training, um, is our training uniform. Acknowledging that depending on, you know, even though there, uh, we service a majority of the agencies, the other agencies serving unique uh, jurisdictions have a large population. So while we may serve a broad range of agencies, Louisville, Lexington, KSP, and Bowling Green, they have a, a lot of people that those agencies serve. So is the training uniform and, and where does it differ? Um, and then uh, what and how to, uh, to, to create a system in order to gather track uh, and utilize that data. What kind of system, what, what's that gonna look like? Yes, sir. Judge Kotoff. Uh Come to you if that's okay. Yes, I'm, I'm Judge Foster Tom from Patricia County, and I'm also as chair of the committee on reviewing search warrants. And we basically discussed at first the scope of our committee, and we determined for reviewing it's basically from when the officer starts the process till they go to the county or commonwealth attorney, and then to the judge. And then at that point in time, once the signature from the judge is on the document, then I think that's the end of our committee's purview. Um, so we, we had that discussion. We also had a nice discussion about um, the drafting of search warrants. And in most places, I think we determined that prosecutors are involved in assisting officers in drafting search warrants, but there are some municipalities and larger cities probably in Kentucky where officers draft their own search warrants. Um, I know they don't do that in Christian County. They, they get prosecutor assistance, but um, I know that because I see the forms. And, but we discussed that and, and we noted in the new draft, no knock search warrant affidavit for, for the new statute, Senate Bill 4, you would have to consult with your higher ups in the chain of command with law enforcement and then consult with the prosecutor before um, getting that warrant reviewed by a judge. So. That's not required right now for a regular search warrant, but that is something I guess we could take a look at. And then we also discussed the retention and storage of search warrants and that process in the clerk's office. And I think all of us probably would like to know a little bit more about that. So with regards to data, then we could help keep up with numbers and things of that nature. Very good. Looking right. forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone from the uh, serving committee? Or Colonel Philip Burnett, State Police. I'll be one of them. I think we did a co-chair. Okay. And uh, what we were able to determine, we're going to have some, uh, just some logistics we need to work out, is uh, what we determined is there's a big disparity in how search warrants would be served dealing with different size of agencies and different locations throughout the state. So we want to try to come up with a best practice for that. Uh, one thing we did also, uh, we, uh, we've identified is that there is a, the exit, the serving of search warrants. That's a big spectrum. 
you have a surveillance search warrant that's uh, for uh, contraband that maybe is not uh, uh, maybe expected by someone versus the execution of a search warrant in conjunction with an arrest warrant for someone that has committed a violent crime where there is a barricaded subject. So there's a lot of things we have to work through. It's just not just serving a search warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we did determine is that no matter what practice or what type of scenarios, there should be an operational plan. So what we intend to do is try to look at what we call possibly a toolkit, things that agencies could pull from depending on the type of search warrant that's being executed. But that's kind of the infancy stage that we're at right now that the, our committee will be going through. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody have any questions for any of our representatives? Um, all right, seeing none. Um, all right, public comments. Uh, do we have anybody who, any public comments at all? Okay. Uh, well, with that, uh, I guess we're ready for adjournment. So can I have a uh, motion to adjourn? Motion. All right. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all. Motion meeting adjourned.